We were on our way to the Krakarov volcano in Russia. While looking over what little information I had on the final member of the Fiendish Five, I began to notice something. In the four parts of the Thievius Raccoonus recovered so far, several of the pictures depict a shadowy owl-like figure, which looks very similar to the police images of the mysterious clockwork. Is this a strange coincidence, or is there something I'm missing? When I was a kid, Sly Raccoon, known in the US as Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus, made a profound impression on me. Without a doubt, Sly Cooper is one of the titles I consider to be seminal in my imagination. You might know the kind of game or the kind of media, the one that forms a key part of how you visualize things in the future, because it sparks your imagination in a particular way. This was a result of many factors. The game's platforming is tight and focused, the game's environments are lusciously rendered, the gorgeous soundtrack by the sadly passed Ashif Hakik is the backdrop to many a video essay script written on this very channel. The actual act of playing the game is joyous, and remains so even today, 21 years on. But the crowning achievement must, of course, be Clockwork. Clockwork is foreshadowed lightly throughout the game. His presence is that of a looming shadow in the darkness, never directly addressed until that exquisite moment I opened the video with. He appears only as a grim shadow in the night when he comes to call at Sly's house. That's when you see the one hint of his true nature, a robotic avian claw. Throughout the game, Sly is tasked with retrieving the pages of his family's book of thieving techniques, the aforementioned Thievius Raccoonus. Throughout this historical text, which of course functions as a funny analogue to human history, we receive techniques from Coopers from as far back as ancient Egypt, and clockwork can be seen looming even in the skies in the book, hovering above the pyramids, if you know to look for him. It is difficult to say just how much impact this had on me when I was a kid without descending into hyperbole. Part of that must surely be the temporality of my approach. I'm not writing this as a child, but as someone looking back fondly on that time. Yet even with perhaps a skewed perspective, I know that Clockwork remains one of my all-time favourite villains. In a game whose other rogues have anthropomorphised appearances, and traits that we can recognise as functionally human, Clockwork, however, is repugnantly other. Unlike the other anthropomorphic animals we see in Sly, Clockwork indeed just resembles a giant owl without any of the humanizing qualities the other characters receive. That silhouette you see of him at the start, there's something weirdly human about it, at least to my mind, for just a moment. But then that goes away on a closer look and you see the animalistic monstrousness about that silhouette. He is a remarkable villain, for a remarkable game, and a noticeable shift in tone too. From Saturday morning cartoon villains like Mugshot, the giant bulldog who always skipped leg day, and fires enormous machine guns he pulls out of his back pocket. To Clockwork, an immortal serial killer who is deliberately presented as monstrous. You don't find out what he looks like, or how huge he really is, until the final boss fight, in a quiet but dramatic reveal as he flies up behind Sly. Sly! Behind you! Sly Cooper, you have escaped my gas chamber and destroyed my death ray. Remarkable. You Coopers always find a way to beat me. Always? So that was you in the background of all those old pictures in the Thievius Raccoonus. How old are you? Perfection has no age. What? You're immortal? Revenge is the prime ingredient in the fountain of youth. I've kept myself alive for hundreds of years with a steady diet of jealousy and hate. Always in a day when I will finally eclipse your family's thieving reputation. Until now, Sly has faced enemies that are approximately his size, but now he must face up against a truly enormous, monstrous foe. It is this explicit monstrousness that first separates him from the other villains, let alone the other characters. Clockwork is a figure who appears animalistic in order to accentuate his lack of humanity, as it were. But the concept of Clockwork is taken one step further than this. He is not just a giant, totally inhuman animal played against human-like animals, 
but he is a mechanical monstrosity who turned himself into a machine. It is important to recognise the term monster, which the sequel uses explicitly to refer to clockwork. Monsterism is, on its face, simple, but peering deeper we begin to unpick a complex self-other binary with a dynamic that can perturb us. As Jeffrey Cohen puts it, monsters are disturbing hybrids whose externally incoherent bodies resist attempts to include them in any systematic structuration. And so the monster is dangerous, a form suspended between forms that threatens to smash distinctions. Monsters resist a fixed state or assimilation within existing systems of knowledge. They are interstitial, things of in-between identity. Clockwork is both animal and machine, yet also with a fiendish human intelligence. That intellect is about the only thing remotely human about him, but he always turns it towards villainy, towards evil. He is still somewhat of a cartoon villain. Clockwork deliberately others himself too. His location perched atop the Krakarov volcano in Russia is deliberately separate from any other being beyond strange fire slugs and mechanical hawks of his own creation. We could argue that, literarily, Clockwork recognises his own monstrosity and chooses to further that monstrosity by isolating himself. Clockwork's isolation was reinforced for me by his power. He literally rises from the lava several times, each time becoming more and more damaged and more deranged. By the end, he is spitting out random garbage, or so it seems. He says words like Blue Seven and Flowers, which allude, perhaps, to his distant, organic past. Yet also, of course, the words that Clockwork are most connected to are said here too. Immortal. What sounds like the words Lava Tomb and I Will Become, alongside I Am. These quotes, as innocuous and small as they may seem, are very important to our understanding of Clockwork's character and the role he fills in terms of the classic immortal villain. Immortal villainy through literature is something that often has roots in a recognition and ultimate rejection of one's own mortality. Becker argues that the root cause of human evil arises from the inevitable urge people have to deny their mortality. Evil stems then from our own fear of death. We tend towards a rejection of that idea in favour of indulging ourselves, sticking our heads in the sand, and often individualistic and personal, perhaps even selfish if taken to an extreme, way. What makes Clockwork so engaging is that, at least on the surface, the reasons he provides for his pursuit of immortality are oppositional to how immortality is rendered through much of literature. Clockwork's reasoning for his transformation into an ageless machine is, quite simply, hatred. Hate is the prime ingredient in the fountain of youth, he argues. I kept myself alive for hundreds of years with a steady diet of jealousy and hate. And for whom? The entire Cooper bloodline. And why? For some unknown slight. His stated reason is a desire to eclipse the Cooper thieving reputation and become the world's greatest ever thief. This is, admittedly, a pretty strange reason, given that he is an enormous, psychopathic serial killer robot owl with a giant James Bond villain death ray, you'd think thieving would be the last thing on his mind. I always took it to be that Clockwork is just giving excuses to Sly. That when Sly is dead, he will take the role of the greatest thief, just because he can and there is no one to fill that role. When we examine the role that Clockwork plays as an immortal villain and the excuses that he supplies for his motives, we can actually start to engage with the idea of what psychologist Irvin Yalom calls specialness. What Yalom identifies as the myth of specialness is a primary response to death anxiety and appears in a number of maladaptive forms. For example, Yalom discusses how the workaholic desperately tries to prove how special and unique they are. Clockwork is much the same. There is too little known about his backstory and whatever slight or tragedy occurred to make him hate the Coopers so much, but we can at least establish that Clockwork as a figure is someone desperately trying to prove how special they are. Every action that he takes against Sly is one meant to prove that Sly is nothing and that Clockwork is superior. He killed Sly's father, stole the Thievius Raccoonus, yet left Sly alive to prove that Sly would never be able to best him without the knowledge contained in the book. 
Yet Sly asserts that the Thievius Raccoonus doesn't create great thieves. It takes great thieves to create the Thievius Raccoonus. Clockwork outright refuses to accept this answer. Wow, that's one tough owl! I don't get it. You're so familiar with my family. You must have known my father had a son. If you hated the Cooper so much, why did you let me live when you stole the Thievius Raccoonus? Because I wanted to show the world that without your precious book, the Cooper line was nothing. Ah, well, there's where you're wrong. The Thievius Raccoonus doesn't create great thieves. It takes great thieves to create the Thievius Raccoonus. Enough, Sly Cooper. It ends here. I will finish you like I finished your father. Then the Cooper line will be erased and the only master thief will be Clockwork. It is also worth considering how ethics tend to factor into our discussions of immortality. While you might not immediately consider how ethics can ground immortality, it is worth engaging with. The idea of evil spirits being damned to wander the earth contrast with ideas of do-gooders getting to leave earth and go on more spiritual journeys. In other words, the body is traditionally evil and the spirit is good. There is much evidence from across the world to suggest that humans almost universally like to think in this way. People may bestow immortality onto good and evil souls alike, but the type of immortality that they bestow appears to differ on the basis of morality. Whereas good souls are described as living on in a transcendent state, evil souls tend to be trapped. Reflecting this duality, Christianity, Hinduism, and Zoroastrianism all have locations where the evil are confined for all eternity, in hell, samsara, and the house of lies respectively, and where the good perpetually live in freedom, in heaven, moksha, and the house of song respectively. This is but a short set of examples that show how we engage with this idea of immortality as being split along another binary. Instead of the self-other monster binary, which Clockwork also marvellously illustrates, this binary is the good evil of the soul, and what happens to the body after death. Other instances from popular culture reinforce this. Obi-Wan Kenobi and Yoda from Star Wars, for instance, become four spirits and are clearly good characters. A study, Perceptions of Perceptual Symbols by Barcelo, and another, Categorization and Metaphor Understanding by Gibbs, reinforce ideas of good and evil being metaphorized. Evil is darkness, heaviness, constriction. Clockwork's ethos, Clockwork's body, is founded on these ideals. His body is now itself a constriction, a heaviness. So it makes sense that Clockwork lives forever. His actions are irredeemably evil and self-consciously so. But these studies talk about the presence of the soul, the idea that a person lives on after death. Clockwork's immortality is a more physical kind of immortality at least at first. Clockwork, as presented in the original game, is centered around the body. His enormous, lava-resistant metal body is a self-made prison, an object that is most certainly a constriction. It is an affront to everything we know about Sly Cooper's world. Yet Clockwork's body is built around that which all immortal beings in literature seem to be built around, the pursuit of a goal. Immortal villains in particular across media are all bent on one all-consuming goal. Sauron from The Lord of the Rings is, in some sense, immortal, and his goal is the consumption and destruction of Middle-earth. Comic books are already a source of immortal villains, given that comics are such a commercial industry that nothing is allowed to change and the status quo is always king. Villains then, like Vandal Savage from DC, pull strings from behind, always cheating death, to pursue some new diabolical goal. Goal is the important word here. Goals are what drive us as living beings. We need goals and a sense of meaning, even if it is just the immediate goal of get home so I can relax and play some more Sly Cooper. Goals can be both long and short term, but we must recognize two things, our own finiteness and the potential finiteness of the goals on offer to us. This might be a difficult thing to grasp or even argue for. I certainly find it as a concept my mind reels at, but we can see it brought up well in an argument by Bernard Williams, who argues at length as to the importance of goals as a function of living. While I disagree with his conclusion, I appreciate his hypothesis. Williams believed that, for creatures like us, an eternal life would be unlivable. 
William's central argument may be represented in three simple sub-arguments. So, part one. Every categorical desire is exhaustible. If every categorical desire is exhaustible, then for person P who categorically desires X, there would come a time T at which P would no longer wish to pursue X. Therefore, for any person P who categorically desires X, there would come at a time T at which P would no longer wish to pursue X. By exhaustible, we mean that with time we will either satisfy our categorical desires or lose interest in them. Give it enough time, your children will grow up and leave home, you will give up on writing that novel, you will witness the seeds of your political revolution yield fruit and change the world, or you will give up on wanting to pursue political revolution. Nothing in particular hangs on these examples. According to Williams, given enough time, you would either satisfy or lose interest in all categorical desires that you currently have. Even if we were to be able to regenerate goals, there comes a point when a goal becomes no longer worth pursuing for a regular mortal mind, Williams argues. Continuing, if for any person P who categorically desires X, then there would come a time T at which P would no longer wish to pursue X, then as long as she continues living, there will come a time T in which P either A becomes intolerably bored, or B develops new, different categorical desires. Therefore, given point 3, as long as she continues living, there will come a time T in which P either A becomes intolerably bored, or B develops new, different categorical desires. If as long as she continues living, there will come a time T at which P either A's or B's, then P currently has no reason to continue living beyond T. And given 5, there is currently no reason for P to continue living beyond T. Williams' argument, therefore, attempts to say that immortality is not worth pursuing because the mortal mind cannot hold onto a singular goal forever, and that any goals we have will eventually be discarded. This may be true, we do not have a real immortal mind to hold onto or examine as a case study. But I can say that, for as long as I can remember, I have wanted to write novels and create video games. These are goals I still hold on to and work to achieve, perhaps long past where others might have discarded them in favour of newer goals. It is a point of pride for me. And, too, we can point to the fact that our childhood selves never would have contemplated the goals we likely have now. Yet we still live. We pick up and acquire new goals all the time. This is all a roundabout way of saying that Clockwork's role in the story of Sly Cooper is illustrative of this goal-based pursuit. Most villains in the Sly franchise are in pursuit of revenge against something or someone, and that something or someone is what drove them to a life of crime, and therefore are prime targets to be taken down by Sly and the player. Yet Clockwork again stands apart from the other villains, in that he is demonstrably immortal. He is also demonstrably other. We can't assign immortal human traits to him necessarily. So for Clockwork, his goal, to eliminate the Cooper family, is a literary contradiction at least to the idea of William's argument. And yes, of course, he is a giant robot owl in a children's video game, I am aware of that. But he speaks to a particular belief about our own minds. That, trained for long enough, we can focus on one goal, to a ritualistic degree. Clockwork again is unique in that his goals are not like that of, say, Vandal Savages. He does not want to reshape the world politically or physically. His goal is just to obtain revenge. Clockwork, rendered in this way, is a character with one button to press. To refute William's argument further, where he says that essentially novelty can no longer be sought, Fisher and Mitchell Yellen argue that it would be absurd to say that, after experiencing a certain number of close special relations, finding any additional one will bring no value to one's life. Clockwork, if he had indeed managed to kill Sly, would perhaps not grow so bored as many people think immortal villains would grow upon ultimate victory. This is not to say I believe in the concept of immortality. I find the idea disturbing and kind of wrong on both a deep subconscious and conscious level, but mostly because the people who would have access to it are the rich and powerful, who would most certainly not value immortality or the lives of others. If only a few can live forever, then why should anyone? But to recenter our focus for today on clockwork, I think that novelty and emotion are two ways in which immortality as a concept is powered in literary terms. Clockwork is entirely powered by the latter, emotion. 
which is what makes the idea of the hate chip as presented in the second game, Sly 2 Band of Thieves, so fascinating. When we consider artificial intelligence, we are certainly more likely to picture an emotionless construct full of logic than something with rampant emotion, yet there are exceptions. I have no mouth and I must screams AM is so malevolent because of his ultimate impotence. AM was created to direct weapons, to create war, and so all he can do is cause pain and hate. Here we come to what feels like the direct literary antecedent of clockwork in AM. While the two works could not be more different in tone and approach, one is a short story about the cruelty and abject endless misery of an immortal life under the dictatorial perverted thumb of a god machine. And the other is a much more fun story about the good guys, a raccoon with a beret, a hacker turtle, and a funny pink hippo who drives a van, winning the day against hatred. Yet AM's infamous remark about hate lines up very much with that of clockwork. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are three, eight, seven point four four million miles of printed circuits in wafer thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved on each nanoangstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro instant. For you, hate, hate. I've kept myself alive for hundreds of years with a steady diet of jealousy and hate, awaiting the day when I would finally eclipse your family's thieving reputation. Clockwork is, in some sense, a more childlike, sanitized version of the all-consuming emotive hatred of AM. This is important because when we consider immortality and villainy, we often picture hatred or revenge as one of the prime motivators. And, of course, AM's origin, I think, therefore I am, connects with a line Clockwork says in his death throes, a defiant self-assertion, even as Sly smashes him to bits. I am. We come then to digital immortality, to finish this strange video of mine. In Band of Thieves, Clockwork's brain is stored on what the game calls the hate chip. One character takes control of Clockwork's body in the finale, and their consciousness is fascinatingly eroded by the hate chip, which is in fact reasserting control of the body back to clockwork. I see the term digital immortality bandied about quite a bit with the rise of artificial intelligence, and the hope that one day we can port our brains into a computer. Immortality is at once liberating and restricting, yet we must return again and again to the idea of evil being restrained. Satan, for instance, in Dante's Inferno is the quintessential idea of this. Frozen, impotent, in a block of ice forever, it shows that evil is, always, in some way, restrained. Immortality for AM, for example, is said to be one of the causes of his madness. He is forever restrained deep beneath the earth. Returning to Clockwork and his hate chip, we can see the power of emotion and the single-minded goal that contributes to our idea of literary immortality. It helps that the character with whom Clockwork fuses also hates the Cooper family. Was it not for the destruction of the hate chip at the end of the second game, Clockwork would no doubt have continued to wreak havoc for the Cooper family. But it is in the fusion of two minds, and the digital, in which my final query lies. The dual mind theory, that we have an old, unconscious mind that makes us demonstrably animalistic, and a newer mind, the conscious mind, which makes us human, whatever you take that term to mean, shows us that digital immortality is profoundly complex. Unpicking it in terms of our case study, Clockwork, we can see that what he has created for himself is most likely the removal of the old unconscious mind. So he is a fusion of the animal body and the human mind stripped of unconscious calls for emotion. Again, we return to Clockwork's seemingly inane death throes, but in those moments there are some phrases that seem terribly organic and connected to a potentially happy youth or a, a tragedy that transformed him, but also some phrases that are just computerizing himself. At once, the lines potentially explain in an abstract way his reason for revenge, but also serve to reinforce that he is really just a machine at the core. The sadly past Kevin Blackton, who voices Clockwork as well as Mugshot and the Panda King, lives on in my memory, 
where I swear at least one voice line from this game will just resurface without warning every day. In terms of what my YouTube channel is accomplishing, I can say that I am creating a kind of digital persistence. The idea that the ongoing presence of the data of the dead online will lead to more of a globalized, secularized ancestor veneration culture, and it is important to recognize the ongoing persistence of the dead online on social media. So I am pursuing a kind of immortality that was not available to those of past generations, as I can catalogue my voice as an artefact, rather than just my written words. But funnily enough, I'm not a living entity right now as I talk to you. I'm just a digital artefact, not something with active emotion. I'm frozen in time. Much as clockwork is emblematic of his hatred, how he is trapped within a singular body, I am, right now, emblematic of my love for this game, in this moment, and my curiosity. What most villains seek to achieve in video games when they pursue immortality is the ongoing idea of power, again, pursuing that goal, but actively. Digital immortality capturing emotion. Is that even possible? It is true that a common criticism of this dual process theory is that we can't so easily assign or ascribe the various features to each process, fast versus slow, automatic versus controlled, non-conscious versus conscious, etc. And what we think of as human is, in fact, probably a complex mixture of conscious and unconscious. We can't ascribe emotion to just a higher or lower processing level. But immortality and cognition, as construed in literature, often simplifies this idea. Yet digital immortality is, nonetheless, endlessly complex. Who can say whether clockwork exists as he did as a flesh and blood owl, or whether the mechanical processes of clockwork's digital mind are merely a copy, not the actual thing? When the hate chip is destroyed, all of clockwork's body rots away. The emotion was all that kept him alive. That was his one goal. So perhaps, in the end, clockwork is nothing more than a single villainous goal. And perhaps that is all we want from our villains, especially in these kinds of simple stories. Can a digital or robotic being, a simulation of a living being, be powered by emotion? This is the question I really want to leave you with today. Would the sum of our life experiences be enough to transfer the seemingly intangible nature of emotion across to a computer machine? Could we rely on goals to power a simulation of ourselves? Can we encode hate. We can certainly teach hate inadvertently. Artificial language models like infamous Tay chatbot can be fed disgusting information and taught to hate. But while we can't argue with what it spits out, we can know that it doesn't feel what it is saying. And does that matter? In Clockwork's case, of course, the answer is no. He still performs the hateful actions because that is what he encoded himself with. Yet as the future of artificial intelligence and learning languages progresses and looms horribly large, we have to learn to at the very least create positive, friendly data sets, so as not to create, inadvertently, a giant, hateful owl. What a great moral. All of this is to say, clockwork and the idea of the immortal villain is one I will forever be fascinated by. How do we engage with immortality? Is the evil and immortality separable from the immortality in ourselves? I hope that I've given you some food for thought, and a recommendation for a game that is slowly crumbling into dust and will be lost to time if we do not act to remember and preserve it. Clockwork's battle, a remarkable jetpack battle in the middle of a live volcano, is dramatic and still lingers in my mind. Every stage of the fight is different and all of Clockwork's dialogue is meaningful in some way or another. In the end, perhaps, in a hundred years even, will anyone remember Clockwork or Sly Cooper? In some way, that is what this video essay is doing, or trying to do. It is a weapon to stave off the decay of a work of art. Clockwork lives on in me, asserting his presence through this video. What I have created, I hope, is a vehicle to digitally immortalize perhaps my favorite immortal villain ever. Clockwork. Thanks to everyone who watched this video. A particularly special thanks to my patrons, Frank Aloons, Future Cityscape, and Blue Voices for supporting me in the content that I make. I couldn't do it without you. 
If you want to join yourself, there are links in the description below. This was yet another love letter to another game that I hold very dear, and as I outlined it is one of the most important platformers and games that I've ever played. I hope in some small, terribly selfish way that it can live on forever. I know that it won't, but that's besides the point of course. Next up, I'm getting back to regularly scheduled programming, analyzing survival horror titles, and I'm in the process of writing a pathologic character analysis script or two. Hope to see everyone there. Um, thanks everyone for indulging this, and thanks for watching. And finally, thanks to the team at Sucker Punch that made this game. I hope it lives on in your hearts as it lives on in mine. And thanks to my parents for letting me rent this from the video store so many times. And then... Uh, yes. And then uh, letting, letting me get it as soon as I found it on the shelf somewhere at a store. Thanks everyone. Cooper! You will never be rid of me. Clockwork is superior.